Good evening, dear friends. Good to be back. We are studying Abram's life in Genesis, and we were reminded in our prayer also that God did not spare his own son. And that's the topic for tonight, Genesis 22. And then I'll also make a connection with what went before. So let's read a few verses in Genesis 22. And it came to pass after these things, so it's a new development in Abel's life, that God tried or proved or tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and there offer him up for a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abram Abram rose early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place that God had told him of. On the third day, Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abram said to his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and we will come again to you. And Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke to Abram his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abram said, My son, God will provide himself with a lamb for a burnt offering. And they went both of them together. And they came to the place of which God had told him, And Abram built the altar there and piled the wood and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abram stretched out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And the angel of Jehovah called to him from the heavens and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, Stretch not out thy hand against the lad, neither do anything to him, for now I know that thou fearest God and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abram went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering in Stead of his son. And Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As they said at the present day, on the mount of Jehovah will be provided. And the angel of Jehovah called Abram from the heavens a second time and said, By myself I swear, says Jehovah, that because thou hast done this and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, I will richly bless thee and greatly multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be bless themselves because thou hast hearkened to my voice. And Abram returned to his young man and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abram dwelt at Beersheba. This is a climax. We have seen in Genesis 12 that God called Abraham with a mighty call. And we have seen in Acts Acts 7 that this is the God of glory. So Abraham met the God of glory and he left the idolatry in which he was involved. His father went along with him to Haran midway to the way to the promised land. And so God had shown himself to Abram and Abram responded to that vision or to that appearance 
through faith. And that's why in the New Testament we see Abram as an example of us. Abram is the father of all the believers. So all the believers also today need to follow Abram's example to say goodbye to the idols and follow God's leadership, God's direction. That doesn't mean it's always easy. It doesn't mean that Abram never failed. Because we've seen that Abram failed from time to time, but God always brought him back. You've seen that in Genesis 12 already, and he built two altars. Abram is an altar builder. You have four altars in Abram's life, two in chapter 12, and then there was a deviation. Abram went his own way down to Egypt. God brought him back, and then came back to that second altar, and then God led him further on. God showed to him that he is, God is the most high God. We saw that in Genesis 14 and 15, and in chapter 15, God showed to Abram the stars. Look at the stars, so your seed will be. So Abram believed God, and that was counted him to righteousness. And that's quoted in Romans 4, and that's for all the believers to put our trust in God like Abram did, and then we develop a relationship with this great God, the Most High, who promised Abram these promises, and Abram believed. You know what happened? Sarah's, uh, Sarah was sterile, Abram's wife, and they couldn't get a son. And so one day they had this smart plan, and Sarah suggested take Hagar, the bond servant, as concubine or wife, and then when she gets a son, I adopt that son, and then we have the plans fulfilled. No, no, no. So God says, no, that's no, that's not my solution. So God showed himself to be the Almighty. That's how we met God in Genesis 17, the Almighty. What does that mean? That God can do anything. God can make the impossible to happen. And that's what happened with Abraham. But because of this important fact that God is the Almighty, Abraham had to learn to not rely on anything of himself. And he had to wait till he could not even father a son. He was too old. He had to wait till Sarah had passed the age to conceive. And in that impossible situation, God gave them a son. When God was speaking about that to Abram, Sarah heard it and she started to laugh. That is not possible. No, from a human perspective, it's not impossible. It's not possible, of course. But God is the God of the impossible. He's the Almighty. And so God gave a sign to Abram. Abram was circumcised. That means removal of the foreskin. And it was a lesson to show you cannot Put your trust in yourself. You can only put your trust in God the Almighty. And he will fulfill plans. And so then Abram believed. And he let God work it out. And then also Sarah believed. I just want to read a few verses in Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, uh, sorry, in Romans 4 we have seen that Abram put his trust in God as an example for us. But in Hebrews 11 we see that Abram, when he was called, responded in faith, he obeyed, and then he moved to the promised land, and he looked for a city that has foundations, and also Sarah believed. We saw that in Hebrews 11, verse 11 at one time. And so she also put her trust in God. And I'd say that just a little parenthesis for couples, married couples, we have to learn to put our trust in God. Not only, not only Abram trusted God, also Sarah trusted God. And when God gave them their son Isaac, laughter, they saw God is the God of the impossible. God is really this wonderful God. And that's what we saw then in Genesis 18, is that anything too hard or too wonderful for God. No, there's nothing that he cannot do. God is the God who is wonderful. And so in Hebrews 11, it continues that they kept in that, they kept going in that faith, 
So also Sarah believed, although she had passed the age to conceive, why did she believe? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. That's the end of verse 11. And as a result of that faith, we see in verse 12, therefore sprang there even of one, Abram, and him as good as dead. So that's why I said he was already too old to father a son. And as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. That's how God can work. Now, what happened after that? Verse 13. These all died in faith. So that must, that doesn't mean that God stopped being faithful. They kept believing that God is going to fulfill the promises. And yet they died. But how did they die? They died in the faith that God would fulfill the promises. They had received the promises through faith. And had been seen from afar off, verse 13. And were persuaded of them. They were convinced God is going to fulfill these promises. Although we are going to die. And they embraced these promises and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And so that's this verse seven, this verse 13 is really a summary also of our situation. We need to continue to put our trust in God. And in verse 14, they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Verse 15, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they had come out, they might have had opportunity to, to return. But now, verse 16, they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. So if you believe in God, then God says, you are my child, I'm not ashamed to be called your God, for he has prepared for them a city. And then we see in verse 17, and that comes down to the chapter that we've read tonight, in Hebrews 11, verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, that's what we read in Genesis 22, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. How could Abram do that? Verse 19. Accounting or reckoning that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. That's the answer. That's the solution. So Abram went ahead with this because he knew that God was going to be faithful to fulfill his promises. And if Isaac would have to die, God would bring him back from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. That's what... Uh, this verse says. And so this line of faith was then continued in Isaac, continued in Jacob, continued in Joseph, continued in Moses. So they saw from a distance that God was going to fulfill these plans. And with Moses, we see, Moses put his trust in the God who is invisible. And that's another example for us. So to come back now to Genesis, I just want to repeat for the young people, also you have five fingers on your hand, right? So, number one, God is the God of glory. Number two, God is the most high. Number three, God is the almighty who can do what is impossible in our eyes. And the fourth one is, God is wonderful. Nothing is too hard for him. We see that in Genesis 18. And here in Genesis 22, we come to the fifth point. God is the God of resurrection. And that's a very important point. God laid the foundation in death and resurrection. Of course, this points to the Lord Jesus who really died. For him, there was no substitute. And who really rose again. And that is the foundation that God has laid to fulfill his promises. And that's what Abram understood, that God was going to fulfill his promises even though he did not, did not know how God was going to do that, but he put his trust in God, that God, if his son would have to die, he would bring him back from the dead. That is the great faith that Abram had. And that's the faith that we need to have in God. So let's go back to Genesis 22. The first verse speaks about 
a trial, a test. And many believers go through trials and testings, but God wants to do us good. It says here, after these things. So Abraham learned many lessons. I mentioned those four points. Now he had to learn one more lesson, and that is that God is the God of resurrection. And so Abraham is available. If God calls you, are you available? Am I available? God has a plan for every one of us. God wants us to say yes to him. Abram was available. Abram says, here am I. So that's the answer of faith. That's the answer of love. He is available. And then what does God ask in verse 2? Take now your son, your only son. That's a term that is the unique son. In the Hebrew, Yachid, that means the only one. There's no other one. Yes, he had Ishmael, but it was not the son of, of uh, Abram and Isaac, uh, Sarah together. Isaac was the unique one that God had given to Abram and, 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 and Sarah, and he loved him. This is the first mention of love in the Bible. Did you know that? First two. So it's not only that he's unique, that he is the unique son, the only begotten as we have in the New Testament, but is the one whom he loves. Here we see the father, Abraham, the son, Isaac, and there is this love relationship. Of course, we can apply that also to our children. We love them. There's a love relationship. But of course, this is the unique relationship between the father and the son. Abraham represents God the father. Isaac represents God the son. And here we see that love relationship we know that God is eternal, and so that love is an eternal love. And it will never end. And in Genesis 24, we see the second mention of love. When Isaac received his bride, we see at the end of Genesis 24, that it says in verse 67, that Isaac loved her. Rebecca. So that was the love relationship between a man and his wife, it's between Isaac and Rebecca. And that's a picture of the love relationship between the Lord Jesus, the true Isaac, and the church. But it is also a picture of a love relationship that we may cultivate with God, but also in the context of marriage. And so this is the second mention of love. So you have the, vort the vertical line between God and us on earth, the relationship of love. You have the horizontal love between a husband and a wife, between Isaac and Rebecca. And so that is a beautiful picture of love in the scriptures. Then we go to chapter 22, verse 2b, where God says, and get thee into the land of Maria, or Mariah. Mariah means foreseen. That was all planned by God. God had foreseen that. The word seeing is in that word. Jehovah had foreseen that. He had planned it. And he said, and there offer him up for a burnt offering. So there was a specific place. And why is that so important? On this place, Later on, the foundation was laid for the temple. You can see that in Second Chronicles chapter 3, after David had the sacrifice on the threshing floor of Arana, we come to Second Chronicles chapter uh, 3, verse 1, Solomon began to build the house of Jehovah at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. The same mount. And God had appeared there to David. That was on the threshing floor of around that he appeared. But on this mount, God was going to have the temple built. With the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So that shows God's plans. And that shows the connection between Genesis 22, that sacrifice of the son, and the building of the temple. 
It's amazing connection. And so, on the basis of the death of the Lord Jesus, the church could be built. That's a whole topic, of course, in the New Testament. But now we go back to Genesis 22 again, and there we see that God says at the end of verse 2, and there, so there was the specific place, as I mentioned in Second Chronicles 3, it had to be there. And it had to be a burnt offering. Burnt offering means what ascends to God. First reference of burnt offering is in Genesis a uh, couple of times, but especially in Genesis 8, after the flood, where Noah had these clean, these pure animals sacrificed as a burnt offering. Burnt offering means a sacrifice of that which ascends. The sweet-smelling savor ascended to God's nostrils, and it keeps ascending. That's the idea of a burnt offering. And so that speaks of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. That sacrifice, that burnt offering that will always ascend into God's nostrils, that will always be a delight to God to think about, it will give him rest and satisfaction. So that is the foundation on which everything is based. And that's why I said earlier, we have to see this is the basis that God has laid in the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So Abram is an example for us. Abram enters into God's thoughts. Doesn't mean that he understood everything, but Abram is willing to obey. And we see that in verse 3, he rose early in the morning. That is often the case with believers who did an important job. They rose early in the morning to do God's will. And that's what Abram does here. He starts his, his uh, journey and he takes Isaac, his son. But he also prepared the wood for the burnt offering. So Abram is very practical. He thinks of the wood. Now you study in the Old Testament the references to the wood. The wood was essential. Without wood you cannot have a burnt offering. So without the wood it would not have been accomplished. And so the wood uh, indicates things that are needed in order to fulfill God's plans. And Abram rose up, so there's the activity of faith. He rose up and he went. So there we have the obedience of Abram. He went in faith to the place that God had told him of. Now I want to connect that also with what we have in 1 Peter 1. When we think of this burnt offering, we think of the lamb chosen by God from before the foundation of the world. So this is an indication that we have in 1 Peter 1, verse 19, I think. I'll just look it up. 1 Peter 1, Peter speaks about that. That he was foreordained in verse 20. So this lamb without blemish, without anything uh, that fell short, was already foreseen by God before the foundation of the world. And Peter says he was foreordained. So this speaks about God's plan. It had to be this way. But God made that plan before the foundation of the world. But he was manifested in the last time, in the last times. So you see how important this is in God's eyes. This sacrifice that Abraham was going to bring is an illustration of what God had in his mind already before the foundation of the world, that there would be a sacrifice needed of the Son of God's love, the eternal Son, the Son, the Lord Jesus. He is pictured in this chapter. And he is indicated by Peter that God had this in mind from before the foundation of the world. Imagine, God thought of you and me of the need that there was of a sacrifice. And God was willing to send his own son. And the son was willing to go to be that sacrifice. It's amazing. So then we go back to the story of Abram in verse 4. On the third day. The third day in scripture is always very important. And often it refers to the resurrection. Because we read in Hebrews 11 that Abram made already the conclusion, if I have to sacrifice my son, God had given all the promises in my son. Then what's going to happen? God is going to raise him from the dead. That's the faith that Abram had. We had read it in Hebrews 11. 
And so Abram went, he had this great face, and now he saw from a distance this place, from afar. And Abram, in verse 5, says to his young man, Abide here with the ass, the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. So this sacrifice is defined by Abram as worship. It was totally different from the customs of those nations around where they would sacrifice in the fire one of the children or the, the oldest son, for example. That was terrible in God's eyes. Moloch or other uh, uh, gods did that. These terrible uh, religions around, in the nations around. That was not God's idea at all. But Abram had the faith in God that if he would sacrifice, he would see that as an act of worship. And he also knew that he would come again. So that's Abram's faith in resurrection. And he says, we're coming back to you. Both. What great faith Abram had. And then in verse 6, Abram took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. Imagine how this must have spoken to Abram to lay that wood that was needed for the sacrifice on his own son. Think of the Lord Jesus carrying the cross on the way to Golgotha. And he took the fire in his hand. The fire speaks of God's holiness. God searches everything out. That's the fire of holiness. But he also took the knife. The knife speaks of God's righteousness. God is always right. right, And he discerns everything and he divides everything. But God is also the God of love. It says in the end of verse 6, they went both of them together. So God's holiness, God's righteousness, and God's love go together. You can't separate them. And in verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abram his father and said, My father. Beautiful fellowship between the father and his son. It's also for us parents important to be available, to be uh, spoken to by our children and to answer them in faith. So this wonderful relationship between a father and a son is a practical lesson for us as well. And Abram said, here am I. So Abram is available to God, as we saw earlier in this chapter, but he's also available to his son. So that is a balance, a very important balance. It's not only needed that we are available to God, we are also needed to be available to one another, and especially to our children. And he said, behold, the fire, he talks, he asks a question. When children ask a question, these are not dumb questions. They think about this, and then they ask this question, Abraham, uh, Isaac asked the question, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? So he, it made sense, this question. It was not a dumb question at all. And he was carrying the wood, Isaac was carrying the wood. And so what did Abram say in verse 8? God will provide himself. God is going to provide the lamb. So that is the name that we see later in this chapter. God had foreseen everything. God will provide everything. But we need to be available like Abram was. We need to be available like Isaac was. And they went both of them together. So that's this common exercise beautiful bond of love. And then they came to the place which God had told him. So God had spoken about it before, about Moriah, Moriah, the land Moriah in verse 2. And now finally they get to that place. And there Abram built an altar. And that's important. I just want to connect that with the three other altars that Abram built. It's always connected with a place. And you can look it up in Genesis 12. Uh, Bethel and the other place that he built an altar and then later on he built an altar when God had shown him the greatness of the promised land and the end of chapter 13 Abram uh, God said you look through the land and at the end of chapter 13 verse 18 he built there an altar to Jehovah the other two places was in chapter 12 uh, the first is in 
uh, verse 7, he built there an altar. And then he goes to verse 8, to Bethel, and there he built an altar to Jehovah. You see? So this is the fourth altar that he built. Again, it's connected with this place where God had led him. There he built an altar. And so this very precise language. So God had led Abram to these four different places, and this is the climax. We don't know exactly how old Isaac was at that moment, but this is the climax in a certain sense, of those four altars. And I'll give you some homework, okay? The children are used to have some homework from time to time. You study Isaac and you find four wells in Genesis 26. You study Jacob's life and you find four pillars. And God appeared to him the first time in Genesis 28, the house of God, Bethel. And so in Jacob's life there are four pillars and then you go to Joseph at the end of Genesis you find four different garments just a little bit of homework but that will help you to see how important these elements are these details are written for a reason for a purpose and every detail is important so we go back to verse uh, 10 he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar. How difficult that must have been for Isaac, for uh, Abram to do. And Isaac, no protest. Imagine. He laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abram stretched out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And then God comes in, in verse 11. The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, we have 48 times in the Old Testament... It refers to the Lord Jesus in pre-incarnate condition. He is the angel of the Lord. And so, here the angel of the Lord stops Abraham, but the Lord Jesus knew that he would be the ultimate sacrifice. He himself would be the sacrifice, as we find in John's Gospel. So, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, another homework. Count the persons who are called twice by name in the scriptures. Abram, Abram is the first one. You have Jacob, Jacob, Moses, Moses, Saul, Saul, and so on. You have uh, seven or eight times. It's always important when God calls twice the name. Did God call your name already? And then in verse 12, here am I. Abram is the believer, he's the obedient believer. And God says to him, stretch not out thy hand against the lad, neither do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God and has not withheld thy son, thy only one. This is the third time we have in this chapter a reference, or three times, if verse 16 is the third time, the only one. So that really emphasizes this relationship between Abram and his son, the unique son, a picture of the Lord Jesus. And then in verse 13, Abram lifted up his eyes and looked. What did he see? A ram caught in the thicket. So there was a provision that God had made. Again, another provision that God had made. And Abram went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So here we have the substitute. But as we said in our prayer or in the hymn, we have the Lord Jesus had no substitute. He was the sacrifice that was needed and nobody could substitute him. So here is a substitute for Isaac and the substitute, the ram speaks of devotion, is really a a picture of the Lord Jesus who would die in devotion, total devotion to God's will and total devotion of love also for us. This is the energy. The ram also speaks of the energy of the devotion. And so here we go. He offered it up for a burnt offering instead. So that's the substitute. And as a result of all this, Abram called that name, the name of that place, Jehovah Jireh. Again, that means God will provide. God had foreseen, and God had foreseen, had provided. Beautiful. So you can put your trust in God. If God promises something, he's going to fulfill that promise. And that's why Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. So that is 
the God who provides. So, as I said earlier, in those five names, the God of glory, the Most High, the Almighty, the one who is wonderful, is also the God who provides. And that includes this resurrection, because, as we've seen in Hebrews 11, the, the bottom line is death and resurrection. And so the Lord Jesus in time came, and he rose again. And every Sunday we are reminded of that great uh, act. This morning I spoke in Devonport about Colossians 2, and we mentioned the cross, that the Lord Jesus had the final victory of all over all the powers of the enemy on the cross. But it was confirmed in his resurrection. The resurrection showed that the work was sufficient, that God had accepted it. So both are important. In, the, in his death on the cross, the Lord had the complete victory over the enemy. But the resurrection was needed to confirm this. And here we have in type the resurrection. God is the God of resurrection. And so that is the greatness of God. And God has put us on the foundation of resurrection. We are in a world marked by death. But God has put us on a new foundation. The foundation of the death and resurrection of the beloved son. That's the foundation on which we stand. No other foundation can be laid. We had it in one of our songs. You can trust God. And so this is the God of resurrection. That's number five. Keep that in mind. Those five things. Okay. And it says in verse 14. It's a beautiful uh, experience of Abram that he had a new experience to put his trust in God. And says, on the mount of Jehovah will be provided. So, Abram learned something new about God, and he continued to put his trust in this great God. And that's what we need to do. We need to continue to put our trust in him. That's not always easy. But that's what we see in the Lord Jesus. He always continued to put his trust in God. We see it in Saul of Tarsus when he became a believer. He kept on trusting God. And here we see it with Abram. He kept on trusting God. And he knew that God would provide. God is the guarantee that he will fulfill his promises. And that's then confirmed in verse 15. Where the angel of the Lord spoke a second time. And he did it with an oath in verse 16. I swear... Now, some people uh, easily use the word swear. We should not do that. This is a very solemn oath. This is the oath based on the sacrifice, the burnt offering, based on the God of resurrection. The word swear is connected with the number seven, the word seven, have in Beersheba. And so this is the oath that God gives now because Abram had been faithful, because Abram had not withheld his own son, he did not spare his son, the only one, and would give him as a sacrifice. Because of that, God says, I will richly bless you. I will greatly multiply. See those points in verse 17 and 18. First of all, God says, I will richly bless you. Secondly, Greatly multiply your seed. And how would he multiply? As the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. Some have drawn conclusion from this that you have the heavenly people here. The believer, we belong to the heavenly people. And you have the earthly people as it will be in the millennium. Okay, you can take that for what it is, but it is a good indication that God will fulfill his plans, his promises on those two different levels, the heavenly side and the earthly side. And then at the end of verse 17, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. That will be fulfilled in the millennium. They cannot do that in their own strength. Okay, we have to realize that. This can only be fulfilled with God's power, just like Abram had to learn that. So, with the best intentions, nobody can fulfill these promises. We just need to put our trust in God. That is also what Israel needs to learn. There will be a remnant in Israel after the rapture of the church. Are you ready? Perhaps today the rapture will take place. And then God will fulfill his plans with Israel and with the nations. And 
he is going to fulfill these promises. And so when God says, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed or bless themselves, that is a reference to what we find in the millennium. And why is this going to be the case? Because you have hearkened to my voice. So that shows how important it was that Abram obeyed. Abram was willing to do what God told him. And that is precious in God's eyes. If we are ready to do God's bidding, can many, you can find many examples in the Old Testament. And just in between, that shows how important it is to read the Old Testament, to read the whole Bible, and keep reading. Because God uses the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, to bring these things to our understanding, so that we enter into these things. And so Abram returned to his young man, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. I mentioned Beersheba earlier, that is the well of the oath, and there he dwelt. So this oath that, that, that God gave uh, indicated something to Abram, and he wanted to continue with that. That is what we have in Beersheba. And the verse that we did not read, and we'll conclude it with tonight, is the end of the chapter where Abram got this message that several family members were born in his family. And at the end, who is mentioned there? Rebecca, verse 23. Bethuel, this one of the relatives that Abram had there, he got a daughter, Rebecca. And why is it mentioned here? Because Rebecca was going to be the bride of Isaac. Isaac, the son of the love of the father of Abram, he would be, he will get a, a wife as his bride and he would love her. So there's the love of the father and the son first and then the love between the son and his bride second. And these two elements go together. God has made it this way and it's inseparable. I talked about the lamb foreknown before the foundation of the world. God's plan to have the church for his son was also part of that eternal plan. And we find that in Ephesians. So think about that. This love relationship between the father and the son and then the love relationship between the Lord Jesus and his bride, the church, go together. That is part of this Ways of God, plans of God are unsearchable. And through Abram's faith, he entered into God's thoughts. And now through Abram's example, we may enter into these thoughts. And the purpose of this all is worship. Abram became a worshiper. He said, we will worship and then come back to you in verse uh, 5. We saw that. So that's what really is precious in God's eyes. God seeks worshipers. The Lord Jesus told that to the woman at the well. God, the Father, seeks worshippers. That means those who are giving a response to his love. That's all about this chapter. It is a response to the love of God, a response to the love of the Father, and we enter into these things through faith, through obedience, and then we will also be able to bring worship and adoration forever and ever. You know what? That will never stop. This response, this worship, will never end. And so what Abram introduced here, this worship, is an example for us to encourage us that we may respond to God's love, and that will never end. So I'll stop here, and just keep in mind those five points. Go over them in your mind. It's worthwhile to do that. And the other homework, you can can take time for that as well, okay? God bless his word. If it's a question, perhaps we can hear that now. You said yes. That, just, just one minute. You go first. You're the older one. Uh, you said the knife represents God's righteousness. Yeah. And what represented his holiness? So far? The fire. The fire. Right. Yeah. And then it goes together with love. Yeah. Another. In verse uh, 19, it says, So Abraham returned. There's no mention of Isaac here. Yet in verse 5, he says, And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and and come again to you. Is there a reason why maybe Isaac is not mentioned in verse 19? I think it's included in the day, but I'm not sure. I have not thought about that.
I only want to emphasize what Abram said, we will come back, Isaac is included. It's not meant to, you're right, so I don't know why. I can't answer your question. <laughs> but in the day, Isaac is also included. In verse, in verse 13, it mentioned here that uh, if the ram was caught in the ticket by the horn, why is it necessary to mention that it was caught in the ticket? Um, yes, so why... Is the horns mentioned in connection with the thicket? So, I, I give a suggestion. If you think the ram is a type of the Lord Jesus, the, light, the Lord Jesus was not surprised by what was going to happen. The horns speak of his power, the power of his love. And so this was the love for the Father, one horn, the love for the church, the other horn, just my suggestion. And that made him willing to be caught. It's not that he lacked, that he failed, but he was willing to be caught in the thicket because of our condition. Uh, the thicket speaks of the uh, condition that started after the fall in Genesis 3. And so the Lord was willing to get into that situation, not because he had failed, but because we had failed. And he was willing to get into our situation in that sense. That is his great love. But I don't know whether you have other thoughts. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So the horn could not be touched by the by the thickets. The horn were speaking of the power, and he was not affected by anything. That's right. It's a perfect lamb, perfect ram. Very good. Thank you. Other points. In Colossians three three, it says, "For ye have died, and your life is hid with the Christ in God." So maybe this is the reason why Isaac wasn't mentioned in verse 19, and this is neither the question. Yeah, we can think about that. Yeah, we are hidden in God, in Christ. That's right. Yeah. So that's good. Think about it. There's so much to think about, you know, and it will lead us to worship. I uh, mentioned earlier worship. God is looking for worshipers. There is so much in the Word of God. I've just mentioned a few things. But it is so rich, it's so wonderful. So keep reading. God bless the Word. Amen.